What is up guys? Thank you so much for joining me today. We're going to be talking about type 8s. We're going to be talking about the checklist for type 8s. This comes from Beatrice Chestnut's new book, The Enneagram Guide to Waking Up. And at the beginning of each chapter, she has a little checklist to say, are you an 8? Here's, here's 10 facts. Here's Here's 12 statements. Do you agree with these? And so we're going to look at these today. Uh, before we get started, thank you guys for uh, for joining me on this video. And in the description below is a link to my website, tomlehue.com, where you can book coaching appointments, uh, Enneagram coaching appointments, or relationship coaching appointments, whatever I can do to help. You can book those there directly on the website. Also, there's information on the website about the certificate programs. If you want to become an Enneagram coach or you want to add that to your, uh, to your skill set, Set, I would love for you to consider uh, taking one of those classes uh, as they're offered. Appreciate you guys. And also on, on Patreon, thanks to my patrons, your support. I know you don't have to do it, so I really appreciate it. All right, so let's get in today to type eight. I need some more eight energy. I'm a seven wing six. And there's so many times in my life when I think, oh, wow, you know, when I don't know what to do, what would an eight do? And a lot of times that's the right answer for me is lean into that eight, stretch into that eight and, uh, you know, grow up and make a decision and uh, don't let people tell you what to do. And uh, I really appreciate type eight and I need I need more of it in my life. Whenever I'm going through hard times, difficult times, I think, oh, what would an eight do? I should probably be able to do that a little easier. So let's talk about eight. Um in this chapter, she begins with a little story about like what it must have been like for a child growing up as an eight, and then she gets to the checklist. And uh, of course, you know I have a lot of experience with eights. Uh, one of my daughters, Grace, her YouTube channel is listed below. Um, Grace uh, is a type eight wing seven, so our first child, first of five, uh, was a type eight. So we've raised an eight. And um, I've got uh, some eights in my life that I've been able to observe. And of course, there's a lot of them on television. A lot of the action heroes in, in movies and TV shows are eights. Kind of the scruffy faced, um, you know, get it done no matter what. Swear while you're doing it. Again, like the action hero. And the, the superpower of eights is super power, is being powerful under pressure. So let's let's kind of dive into um, the narrative that she gives us about what it must be like for the child growing up as an eight. She begins by saying, you know, the eight comes into this world. She's a sensitive and sweet little child, innocent, wide eyed, you know, looking at life, uh, you know, learning from everything, taking it all in, feels very protected, feels very taken care of, feels very, uh, you know, sure of herself and sure of her environment and just comes in with all of this like innocence, which is a key word for you type eights, innocence, because although you might feel like, you know, the least innocent or maybe appear that way, Innocence is really a big issue for you. That might be a word for you to just kind of like think about all year is like how you protect innocence, how you're drawn to innocence, um, you know, how you 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 tend to like uh, be attracted to innocence. Think the little animal or the little helpless child or the, the disabled person. There's something that just draws you, that vulnerability, the very thing that maybe you tend to like kind of hide in yourself or displace in yourself is what you're often drawn to, to protect, to take care of, um, to, to maintain in others or in, in the environment around you. So she comes into this world completely innocent, wide-eyed, you know, uh, taking it all in, feeling very safe, feeling very protected. But then early in, in her life, there's a moment where this little, sweet, innocent eight realizes, you know, people aren't going to come through for me. People aren't, people aren't going to stand up for me when I need them to. Like maybe there's a bully on the playground, you know, that says something mean or pushes you down or takes your toy. And I can see that little eight looking up at her parents, you know, are, do you see this? Do you see what just happened here? Are you going to do anything about this? Are you going to intervene? Are you going to tell this kid to stop? Are you going to are you going to tell this kid to 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 leave me alone? Oh, you're not. You're not going to do anything. You're not going to protect me. You're not going to take care of me. Huh? Wow. Let me just let that sink in for a minute. 
here I am, an innocent little child, playing with my shovel and pail. This bigger kid comes, takes it out right out of my hands, and that's okay. That's just the way the world works. I'm just supposed to accept this. I look up at mom and dad and I think, surely they're going to do something. Surely they're going to step in and they're going to tell this bully of a child, stop that. That's not your shovel and pail. You give that back to, to our little princess. But apparently mom and dad don't care. Apparently they just don't doesn't matter to them if I get pushed around and I get picked on and they take the toys right out of my hands. Apparently that's fine. Now, I can visualize maybe these moments in, in my past with, with our little Grace, but I imagine that every eight kind of has this experience in one way or another where they just kind of realize like, you know, if it's going to be, it's up to me. Like if... If something's going to be done about this, well, they're clearly not going to do anything, so it's going to have to be me. I'm going to have to take matters into my own hands here. Um, and it's kind of like what, um, oh, where's the book? Um, well, one of these books on my shelf, um, she says every eight has a, uh, well, she says it very colorfully. Let's just say every eight has the uh, screw you moment. Let's let's say it that way, um, where they just realize like you know this is this is bull crap. This is not acceptable. This is not going to go down okay. No, 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 and they just kind of have that. I can feel the energy, guys. I when I do eight videos. I can feel the eightness. It feels great. It feels fantastic. I can see why eights are eights. Um, I, I'm clearly not an eight. I'm a seven. But I can feel just a little bit of that. Just like I can feel the anxiety of the six. Like, oh no, somebody's upset with me. Oh no, uh, what do I need to do? Are you okay? What? I'm sorry. I can feel all that six stuff or some of that six stuff. I, on the other end of this, I can feel that eight stuff. When I start making the video, I just, I can, I don't know. I just feel bigger and stronger and... And the fact that I tell you that, you you can tell I'm clearly not an eight because an eight would never tell you this, okay? Um, it's just who they are. So I think I think it's true that, you know, every eight, it was it called the millenniagram. Now I'm now I'm looking over here at my books. Um, hmm. Oh, this is it right here. This book. This book called the millenniagram, but I don't recommend it. Because it's got a lot of colorful language. I was surprised. And when she gets to chapter 8, it's like no holds barred, okay? But I do like, I do appreciate that one little comment, you know, that like every 8 has kind of the screw you moment. Like, nope, this is not going to be, this is not the way it's going to work. No, I, I no. I, it's kind of like, I can't be a child. I have to grow up and I have to grow up quick. I've got to, let's, I think instead of grow up, that's more like a 1. Let's say the one thinks I need to grow up. I think with the eight, it's more like I need to get big fast. <laughs> I need to get big. I need to get bigger. Um, I need to, you know, to, to get bigger and scarier and more powerful really quickly. And so whatever it was in your life, you know, whatever it was, that moment when... Um, you realize, like, I've got to take care of myself. And not only myself, but who's going to take care of these little ones? You know, somebody's got to be in charge here. Somebody's got to take responsibility. Somebody's got to take action. Okay. I've got to get big fast. I've got to get strong fast. I've got to get powerful fast. I've got to be fearless. I can Okay, one of the ways to deal with fear is to decide to become fearless. And that's kind of what, like, counterphobic sixes are trying to do. You know, and they kind of look like eights. They're not eights, but they kind of look like eights. It's like one of the ways to deal with your fears is to decide I'm going to be fearless. I am not going to give in to fear. This is this is bull. Um, bull stink. <laughs> the words are in my head, but I can't say them. All right. I've got to be fearless. I've got to be strong. I've got to be powerful. So instead of being scared, I've got to become scary. Now... I don't think that's true, but I'm not an eight. I don't think that's true. I think there's other ways you, you could deal with your fears rather than I need to become what people are afraid of. I can't, I can't give in to fear. I'm going to be what they fear. I'm going to be scary myself. And then I'll push back all of these threats. 
That is one way to deal with fear and one way to deal with a feeling of powerlessness is to just become super powerful. Kind of like the Hulk, you know. He's in his own Bruce Banner energy. He's what, a nine or a five or a six or something and then eight. You know, he's just like crashing and slamming and smashing stuff and he has nothing to be afraid of because he's so powerful. Why? why what could anybody do to him? Okay, so I've got to become scary instead of being scared. Um, and this one thing that helped her be strong is her ability to get angry. You know, anger makes you powerful. Anger makes you stronger. Anger makes you bigger. And so anger is preferred rather than feeling helpless and indecisive and dependent on others. That feels like a child. That feels like a helpless child. I don't want to feel like a helpless child. I want to feel big, confident, and strong. And anger, I think, helps me feel that way. So I prefer, as an eight, I prefer feeling anger as opposed to feeling other things. And I think sometimes when you're with an eight and they look very angry, you might kind of have a mental exercise you run in your head like, is anger the natural response that a person should feel based on what just happened here? If it was me, I would probably feel scared or sad or indecisive or, you know, I might feel uh, frustrated. But why do, why do they go to anger? Well, because they don't want to feel all the stuff that makes them feel like a child. That kind of stuff like is put away from them. That innocent, helpless child. I'm dependent on mommy. Mommy's going to take care of me. That that gets put aside and, and they don't want to see that in themselves. So... I've got to get bigger, and one of the ways to get bigger is to get angry. So where ones who actually are, uh, have the sin of anger and don't want to look angry, eights prefer to look angry. So eights look the angriest, but I don't know that they're really always that angry. I think if you could go down beneath the surface, underneath the anger, you would probably, you would probably realize there are other emotions that are being expressed as anger. Like instead of being, instead of expressing fear, I'm going to express anger. That feels more powerful, feels more comfortable. But like when you get right down to it, what they don't maybe want to realize about themselves is right now you're just scared. You're scared. So, you know, you come out with who's to blame? This is ridiculous. This is, well, okay, let me move on. So eight feels like a lot of energy. Um, it makes you feel more capable. It makes you feel like you're in control of your environment, like you can't be taken advantage of. Eight didn't even notice when she wasn't protected anymore or when she was helpless or she didn't even feel that anymore because the only problem is, you know, now that that anger like makes you feel big and powerful and strong, like you're not even noticing like that, that sense of helplessness or fear anymore. But here's, here's kind of one of the, the negatives. Here's okay. Here's a problem with this, with this plan is now the train has left the station and sometimes maybe the anger gets away from you or gets ahead of you. You know, like once you let the cats out, once you let the, uh, once you let the horses out of the stable and now they're running free, can you really corral them back in? In other words, you know, sometimes anger, which makes you feel very strong and powerful, yes, it makes you feel capable, it makes you feel like you're in control of your environment and you're not helpless and you're not weak and you're not a child and all those things that you want to avoid, but does the anger sometimes take you farther than you want to go? Does it sometimes take you beyond what you really want? I mean, are you able to control this anger? What's the whole point of the Hulk, right? He, he, he has to work really hard to try to control this. The problem is not that he's not powerful enough. The problem is, is, is he able to control that power and use it when it's appropriately? Uh, or when it's appropriate, okay, I should say. So, you know, the problem is now, like, anger's coming up all the time. Anger's coming up, you know, um, and it's and it could damage these relationships that you want to have um, if if it's not if it's not moderated. If it's first of all not observed, you have to observe it and say, "Wow, I I didn't even see it. I didn't even see the anger. I didn't even I didn't even realize it. I just it just feels like energy. It just feels like intensity." But how is it coming? How are you coming across to other people? Now you might say, "Well, I don't care." I don't care. Okay, you do care because 
think about what your goals are for your life. One of your goals for your life is probably to have a great relationship with somebody and be married to them or, you know, be intimate with them and to love each other and take care of each other and to have some joy and happiness and to relate well to all your family and have good friends and community around you. I mean, we all have these goals, right? But what you don't realize is that maybe sometimes the way you express your energy, the way you express your confidence or your desire to not be afraid or to not feel indecisive might come across to other people in a way that makes it difficult for them to relate to you. And I know you might, you might just, your impulse might be, well, that's their problem. I know. Okay. I get that. I get that. Um, But let's put it this way. Maybe there are people who are trying to love you that find it impossible. They find it difficult to, to, to love you. You're trying to love them. I get it. I get it. By speaking your truth, by being clear, by being direct, by being frank, by being, you know, um, by being honest with them, by saying what you mean, by what you see is what you get, by calling out garbage. It's your way of showing you care. I get it. Um, But it could come across to some people as, wow, that's a lot. Like it's too intense. Like I'm afraid of that. Well, that's their problem. I get it. But it's your problem when you're the way you interact with people isolates you away from the very people that, that you want to love and want to love you. Now it's your problem because you might find yourself all alone. Powerful, strong, but alone. And that's not really what you want. I know that's not what you want. Look, you go to two. You look like a two in health. Okay, who's more love, love than twos, right? So it is in there within you to want to connect to want to to be in loving relationships with people, to put people in your fort, okay? Um, So I know that your desire is you want to connect with people. You want to have this community around you that you support and supports you, that you love and loves you. But just start to observe. That's all I'm asking, okay? Just start to observe that maybe the way I'm interacting with people might be making it difficult for them to feel comfortable with me. Well, I don't care. Okay. But you you don't want to be alone. Okay? And you're trying to express care. It's just, it might be in a way that is difficult for people to understand. Okay? And being softer is not, is not and being more vulnerable is not going to drive people away from you. If anything, it's going to, it's going to bring people in closer to you. Okay? I mean, imagine having that conversation like, Instead of, where were you last night? No, where were you? You said you would be home at 9 o'clock. You were not home at 9 o'clock. This is bull crap, okay? Instead of saying it that way, right now anger is is protecting you and you feel very powerful in that anger. But that's hard. that's hard for somebody who, maybe they're innocent. Maybe they're innocent. Maybe they just got held up at work, okay? And so it's like, what do I say to that? I... I don't want to make this worse. I can see obviously you're upset. I mean, is my head going to get knocked off? I don't know. So being vulnerable with people feels very uncomfortable, but it's going it, to it's what growth is part of what growth is going to look like for you. Okay? So imagine, you know, what might really be going on is when when you don't when my spouse or my boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever, when they don't come home, at the time that they said they were going to come home, I feel scared. I don't, I don't like that. I feel unsure. I feel like maybe something might be wrong. I feel like, uh, you know, I, could, I tried to call them and I couldn't get a hold of them. And I don't know what's going on. Maybe they're dead and lying in a gutter somewhere. Or maybe they've been duct taped and thrown in the back of a van. Or maybe they don't love me anymore. Or maybe, now see, all of that, you don't want to, you don't want to think about that. But I want you to realize that maybe something like that is really underneath all of this anger you're projecting. It could just be fear. Like, I was scared. I was worried. But see, that's what helpless children feel. Helpless children feel scared and worried. So you don't feel like you can express that. And maybe you don't even like cognitively have the thought, I'm scared, I'm afraid, uh, I'm worried. You know, they didn't call me. Maybe they don't really care about me. You, You may not even have the cognitive thought. Your thinking might not work that way, but I want to just encourage you to like press in a little bit and see what might be under this anger. It might just be a giant heart that's afraid of being hurt. 
And if people could see that giant heart, it's not going to make it's not going to make the people that really care about you, you know, like think less of you. If anything, it's going to draw them closer into you. You have to be able to see that, you know, that, that that if people could see that, oh, you were worried about me because it sounds like you're attacking me. You know, it sounds like, where were you? This is, you know, eight goes to five with the investigator. You know, where were you? What what was what what do you have to say for yourself? This is ridiculous. Did you stop and get a drink? What what where did you stop? Who did you who were you with? OK, I feel like I feel like I'm being attacked. I feel like I'm being stripped. I feel like I'm being uh, ob- observed um, under a microscope. I feel like I'm being, you know, out on the, I'm on, I'm out walking the plank and I'm standing at the edge of the plank and the pirates got their sword under my throat and they're, what am I supposed to do? So people might react with anger and with fighting with that approach. And it's not that there's not a time for that. There is certainly a time for strength and power and and control and dominance. I, there's certainly a power. There's certainly a time when somebody needs to stand up and take control of the situation. But I mean, let's give the other person the benefit of the doubt. They love you. They care about you. They had to work. Um, they they got caught up in their job. They're trying to provide and take care of the bills, and they lost track of time. And so. What if, if you could see yourself, you know, doing a different mental gymnastic here and saying, you know, it really makes me worried when they don't call me and they don't come home on time. I could, I could kind of, you know, feel nervous and scared about that. I I know you're not going to want to say this out loud, but just if you could observe that maybe some of this is beneath the surface and then your approach to the other person, how you present to the other person, hey, I was worried about you last night. Um... What happened? I thought you were going to be home at nine, but you know, I, I, I was concerned for you. Oh yeah, well I was. I mean that's a totally different conversation, and it might move you more toward the goals you really want in life of having that loving, kind, caring, you know, relationship. Well, hey, could you call me next time? Because I was, I was getting a little worried. You know, I love you, Schnooky. I love you, Schnookums. I was getting worried about you. Mm. That was me rubbing the head. Mm. Okay. At this point, you've either turned off the video and said, this guy's ridiculous, or maybe you have a little tear in your eye. Like, yes. Why is it so hard for me? I know. It is. But, hey, we're all in this together. I'm inside your fort. I'm here to help you. I'm never going to betray you. I'm, I'm here to, to help you, okay? All right, we're all in this together. Okay, so um, she didn't need anyone. She was strong enough by herself. Everyone else seemed much weaker than she was. And so I don't need them. They're all weaker than me. In fact, weakness in others is something to be angry about. Now, every once in a while, maybe there's somebody who legitimately is weak, you know, somebody with a disability, a deformity, or somebody that, you know, has some kind of challenge to them, and watch that eight feel responsibility to protect that, because that's true weakness. And an eight can realize that's true weakness, that person should be protected. But Johnny over here, he's just a, you know, he's just being weak. He's just being, he's waffling, you know, he's being limp. Uh, And so... I'm not going to protect him. I'm going to push on him and see if he strengthens up. And if he doesn't, then he's on his own. You know, I'm done with him. Eights can feel a little bit lonely. Wow, just let that word sink in for a minute. I mean, we could pause right there and just think about your own life. Uh, Has that ever been an issue for you? Do you ever get like after the the incident... (laughs) after the incident, you know what I'm talking about, you know, after you lost it and you saw red and you went ape on somebody, you know, after you stormed out of the meeting, turned over the tables, my son, who's a five, has got me watching all the Marvel movies now in order. And I pause them so that he can tell me all the stuff I don't know. So we pause the movie constantly so he can tell me all the facts that I don't know. And, uh, you know, I'm watching Thor in the first Thor movie. 
um, going off in all of his power, making things worse. And then when he's reprimanded, you know, the next scene is him turning over all the banquet tables um, because in his mind, he's trying to help. He's trying to do the right thing. He's trying to protect Asgard. He's trying to protect the Empire. But he just kind of runs off. He acts before he thinks. There it is. He acts before he thinks. You have a line to five. Eights, you have a line to five. You have a line to five. Now, I get it. Under stress, eights can look like a five in that they like restrain. they like, I'm not talking to that person. I'm not talking about this anymore. I'm not giving any energy to this. I don't care. Super walls and boundaries go up like a five. I get all of that. But I want you to see that sometimes the number you disintegrate to, it's kind of like it warns you. It says, hey, you know, you should do more what I do. Um, or you're going to end up, you know, withdrawing like me as a five from you're you're an assertive type why are you withdrawing because you're done you know but i think the five might give a little bit of coaching to the eight saying hey before you go to action i know you're in the action group up there i know you want to do something i know something needs to be done about this i get that okay but before you do that why don't you come down here to five and think about it first you know fives are the perpetual thinkers or proverbial thinkers why don't you come down to five and why don't you withdraw for a moment and think about what you're going to do before you do it? Because what often happens with eights is they do it and then when it doesn't give them the, the results that they thought it was going to get them and now they're in trouble and now they're the ones getting reprimanded or suspended or fired, then you'll see that eight thinking about, you know, why it didn't work out the way that they thought it would work out. And that is a very lonely place to be. And I wonder, as an eight, you can tell yourself, well, other people are stupid. The rest of the family is idiots. That's what the problem is. I was born into a family of idiots. Okay, you can tell yourself that and make yourself feel better about your predicament that you are in but, you know, nothing's really going to change in your life until you start to observe, you know, how am I and my behaviors and my actions contributing to my isolation and loneliness? Maybe I'm all alone because it's hard for people to relate to me. And, well, they've got the problem. I know, I know. They've got the problem. And as long as they've got the problem, well, I guess there's nothing you can do to make life better. I guess you've decided they have all the power and you have none. Is that acceptable to you as an eight? That they are the reason? They are in control and not you? Is that acceptable to you? What kind of control do you have over your relationships and over your uh, joy? What kind of control do you have over how you're getting along with people? None. It's all just up to them because they're idiots and this is the way it is. I just want you to think about it because it can be a very lonely place to be. It's lonely for ones to be at the top of the moral high ground. It's lonely for twos to be the only one in the family that's nice and kind and loving and everybody else is mean. It's a very lonely place for threes to be at the to be the the the, the lion and the top dog in the organization while everybody else is sheep. It's a very lonely place for the four to be up in their room sad and crying while everybody else is pretending that they want to be at my birthday. It's a very lonely place for the five to be down in their submarine with their periscopes studying the world but removed and withdrawn away. It's a very lonely place for sixes to uh, be stuck in their head panicked and worried and the only one that's being vigilant, the only one that's being concerned. It's a lonely place for seven to be the first one on every ride by themselves uh, in their van driving across the country with no job with no paycheck it's a very lonely place for nines to be um avoiding conflict um and withdrawing because i've got to get away from this uncomfortable situation so i'll just go sit out here on a rock in the woods it's a very lonely place for eights Everybody else is ridiculous. Everybody else is being ridiculous. Okay. You know what the Enneagram shows us is people are ridiculous. They are. We all are in our own ways. But realize this. Nobody does what doesn't make sense to them. Everybody's doing what makes sense to them. 
It just might not make sense to you. And not all of us are terrified of being afraid or terrified of not being in charge or terrified of having to take some time to make a decision. Not all of us, you know, some of us are okay with, well, I want to hear every side and I want to deliberate on this and I want to think about it some more and I want, I want, I want to take time to listen to as much counsel as I can. What looks like indecision to you might just be wisdom to another person. Okay, let's keep going. So it can be a very lonely place to be the most powerful person. Back to the Hulk. He's a very lonely character. If you remember the show in the 70s, you know, in early 80s, um, when um, the main character, Bill Bixby, uh, when he would, it would always end the same with him having to leave, having to leave the town he was in. He'd come into a town, he would try to just be a person, he would get beat up, he would turn into the Hulk, he would destroy everything, and then what would happen? At the end, they'd play this sad song, and off he went to another town to try to start over, to try to start over, to try to start over. And I think if you're an ape, you probably know that feeling of like getting removed from office or getting removed from a job or getting removed from, you know, and thinking, I don't understand what went wrong here. You know, I was just trying to do the right thing. And yet here I go again, kind of in this lonely position. Well, you know what? I don't need anybody anyway. Really? Okay. Well, that's not what God says. All right. Let's see, what does it say here? Um, she didn't really care if anyone liked her or not because I lost all the sensitivity that I was born with. Okay, I mean, that's what she says. They lost all the sensitivity they were born with. I don't think it's true. I don't think she thinks it's true. I think the eight kind of pretends like it's true. I don't care. I don't need to be sensitive anyway. Um, it doesn't work to be sensitive. It doesn't, it's hard to be sensitive and powerful at the same time. You got to take care of yourself. But I know you are a very sensitive person. The world touches your heart. I know it. I know it does. It doesn't feel comfortable to talk about it, but I know it's true. And so do you. Soon the ain't notice they can't stop getting angry. Can't stop being strong. Can't stop being powerful. And why should I? Why should I anyway? Um, I'm not sensitive and innocent anymore. Okay. It's better to be strong and powerful. I mean, I might be alone. I might be sad. No one's here to take care of me. But that's fine. I'll take care of myself and I'll take care of everyone else too. I feel glad I have all this energy and strength and powerful. Nothing's going to hurt me. It's a good thing. Um, sometimes it's hard on me, but it's a good thing. So ape becomes a zombie. A forceful, unstoppable, and somewhat unapproachable zombie. Now, here's the checklist, okay? Here's the list of all the... You might be an ape. All right? Here's what she says. Number one, you usually come across assertive and direct. The people that love you, love that about you, that you can be assertive and direct. You know where your yard is. You don't let goats come into your yard. You push the threats away. You can be assertive. You own your space. You own your time. You own your energy. You own your word, no. If you don't want to do it, you just say no. It's a wonderful thing. Probably no comes to your mind first. You know, think about a seven and a nine right next to you. Both of us, yes comes to our mind first. Hey, you want to go get, you want to go get something to eat? Yeah, let's go. Sure, no problem. Eight. No. I mean, you might eventually get to yes, but it probably starts out as no. Like, no, I don't, you're not telling me when to go eat. No, I don't want to go eat that. Who put you in charge? Assertive. That's a good thing. Assertive is good. When you get out of your yard and you start trying to control somebody else's yard, well, now it's not assertive anymore. It's aggressive. And you got to pay attention to like, where's that line? I think fives are probably the boundary kings and eights are really good at enforcing their own boundaries, but not so good maybe at respecting other people's boundaries. It's kind of like, well, 
you know, if they don't care, then I'll just move my crap over into their yard. They didn't, they didn't say nothing. So that's them. That's on them. Well, okay. If somebody were to do it to you, well, they're not going to do it to me because I'm big and powerful and strong. Okay. But I just want you to see that like you want people and expect them to respect your property lines. Are you good at respecting other people's property lines? Just an observation. Just, just asking, just think about it. You know, how would you feel if somebody came in and just started rifling through your drawers and picked out what they wanted to wear and put it on in front of you? Would that be okay with you? Because that's what you do to other people. You open, you go in, open their drawer, dig around, rifle through their desk. Um, oh yeah, hey, I needed a zip drive, so I just took yours. Hope that's okay. Okay, how would you feel if somebody went into your office, rifled around through your drawers and, you know took what they wanted, and then said, hope it's okay. Probably wouldn't be acceptable, acceptable to you, acceptable. Probably wouldn't be acceptable to you. But your tendency is to kind of be like that with, with us. And some people are really going to appreciate that. They're going to go, that Sarah, she's just, I just need to be more like Sarah. She just, you know, makes things happen in life. And other people are going to be like, wow. Um, I'm going to remember that. And they're not going to feel happy about that. Okay, assertive and direct. You specialize in taking action quickly and decisively and sometimes impulsively. Taking action quickly. Okay, that's what makes you look like a leader because you're willing to make decisions and you're willing to just go and it doesn't mean you know the right action that should be taken. It just means you're willing to take action first. Because sitting there, well, I don't know, what do you guys think? Well, I don't know, what do you guys think? I mean, we could do it this way and we could do it that way. That just feels like nonsense, like weakness, like helplessness, like, Mommy, is it okay, Mommy? That's what it feels like. And you're not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to move. I'm just going to, and you, so you just move into action. Did you stop and think? Remember eight line to five? Did you stop and think? Is this the right action? Um, are you leading people off a cliff? Do you know? Um, people are following you because you're willing to take action. And you kind of like, I'll sort it out on the way because I'm powerful. I'm strong. I'll figure it out. I can, no matter what comes against me, I can just, I can just blow up and I'll push it back and nothing's going to happen. That could sometimes maybe get you into precarious situations where you might bite off more than you can chew. Um, and the people that are following you, do you really want to take responsibility for them? Are you really ready to be responsible for whatever whatever happens to all the people that are in your bus? All the people. Well, I don't care if they're in my bus. I know. But see, they're following you because you are the bus driver now. And are you really ready for all the consequences that might happen to them? Because that's what leaders do. Leaders don't just plow their way forward. Leaders take responsibility for all the people that are following them. And that might be something that you are a little more uncomfortable with. Like that might be something like as an eight, like I don't want to hold their hands. But that's what leaders do. Leaders do hold people's hands. Okay? They take responsibility. You focus much of your attention on working to ensure justice or fairness or trying to bring the truth and order to everything you do. Good. That's really good. Are you being fair yourself with people, though? You recognize when other people aren't being fair and you want to stop it. Okay? But maybe you don't, maybe you have the blind spot of not always seeing how you're not being fair with people. And you want truth to be honored. I think I want to push just a little bit on that. Just, I want truth to be honored too, but sometimes what you might call truth might be just the way you see things. Okay. Just the, what you're, what you're saying is the truth. If you really boil it down at times, it might not be the objective truth. It just might be your version of the truth, like your record of the events, the way you saw it, your perspective, the way you think about it has been labeled by you as the truth. And that's what's got to get out. 
Okay? Sometimes it's just enough for you to know you're right. You don't have to, like, make that the, uh, the campaign. You have difficult time containing your reactions when you get, especially when you get angry. So, people know where I stand. You don't have to wonder about me. You know where I stand. What you see is what you get. That's a good thing. I mean, that's good to be proud of that. Um, but, you know, sometimes, it seems like sometimes it's one way or the other with eights. Either you have the eight that is just obvious, you know, like, this is bull. This is stupid. This is ridiculous. This stop. And sometimes you have the eights that just sit silently. And, like, you can see, like, the steam, you know, coming off of their head. And they're just not going to say anything. They're just sitting in the meeting not saying anything. And it's like, you know something's boiling inside them. Other eights, it's just boom, 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 boom. You know, they're just going to address every little issue. But then I think there's a whole other type of eight that just maybe sits and seethes. And then at the end, <laughs> scorched earth. You know, scorched earth at the end of the meeting. Um, and then you'll see sometimes the rest of the people like, well, I don't know. We got scorched earth, so I guess we need to do what Marty wants because, you know, he's terrifying. The Hulk, you know, just went loose on us, so we need to just do whatever Marty wants. Um, okay, so difficult time containing your reactions. That's why I think it's hard to be in that middle spot. Okay, that's that's what I'm saying. It's hard to be in that middle spot. Either you're going to be, well, that's ridiculous. That's dumb. That's stupid. We need to do it like this. Let's go this way. Let's do it this way. Why do we have to do that? She's not in charge. That, okay, you're either like running things or you're sitting over seething. Can you be in the middle? Can you just be like a person in a meeting, like having discussion and, oh, let me, let me see your point of view. You know, I see your point of view and I, and I hear your point of view. Oh, okay, well, that makes a lot of sense, too. Wow, this really is a conundrum that we're going to have to work together to solve. I think that middle spot is probably very difficult to be in. Um, remember, as an eight, you have a nine wing. Might help a little bit in that situation. You value honesty, directness, and authenticity. You tell the truth and want others to do the same. Okay, honesty, directness, and authenticity. All good things. Super great things, right? But I think, you know, there is there is a word to be said about being diplomatic. There's a word to be said about being cautious, about being even-handed. And you win more, uh, you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. And that being honest doesn't mean I need to be cruel. And there's that fine line where being honest turns into being cruel. And, you know, the lowest level of health for the eight is called the bully. And I think eights hate bullies and then can be surprised that sometimes they're perceived by others as being one. Because I was just saying things the way they are. Marty is a idiot and he needs to be fired okay it's not that that might be true and we appreciate you being honest it's just marty is collapsing in on himself with tears running down his eyes and he's shaking you know because of this interaction well that's because he's weak that's right there another reason why he needs to be fired okay Everybody else is looking at this like, yikes, yikes, yikes. It's not that it's not honest. It's just you got you got such a line there, right? That you gotta. We want you to be honest. Be honest. Just also, what did what does Jesus say? Speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Jesus came full of grace and truth. It's okay to have the truth. You just also need the grace. You need the you need you need the love. You can't you can't you can't just let loose on people when you have no relationship with them. When you have no love for them or no care for them. People pick up on that, you know, that you don't really love them. You don't really care about them. 
Okay, you have a lot of energy and enjoy talking about big challenges. You don't back down when confronted with difficult situations. All right, that's awesome. And I think, you know, twos have a line to eight. And I think in a lot of ways, twos are like that too. When twos get under pressure, when twos, you know, get challenged, when twos are facing a, a, a crisis or in an impossible situation, you'll see twos blow up and become more powerful and strong and able to deal with whatever is, you know, facing them. And eights, I mean, this is your, this is your, your home address is just the more difficult, probably the more you are excited about it. The more overwhelming the odds, probably the more, the more energy you're going to approach it with. Why would you want to do something that's lame and boring and, you know, not a challenge? While you may say you don't necessarily like conflict, you can engage with it when necessary. Um, you're good at conflict. Um, you're good at keeping your sense of yourself and making your points and, you know, crossing swords with people. You're okay with that. Again, you want to be careful that you don't push into being cruel um, and that you keep your goals in sight. Like, what's my goal here? My goal is not to get fired from my job. Okay, my goal is is to call out corruption in my in my workplace while keeping my job if possible. So before I say this out loud, let me remember what my goal is here. My goal is not to blast everybody and end up getting fired because that's probably what's going to happen. My goal is I need to be careful and methodical and diplomatic in how I express my truth to do it in such a way as to accomplish, you know, the the objective. Okay, slow down a little bit and pause. It's going to be in your best interest to do so. You can sometimes be excessive in the things you do. Eating, drinking, working too much. Um, you know, if you decide that you found the best Chinese restaurant in town, you might just eat there every night. Okay. If you decide you're going on a diet, okay, I'm not eating for the next three weeks. I'm not eating anything. Okay, that's a little excessive. All right. Uh, you tend to be protective of those you care about. I think eights might describe if you love a child, then i.e. it's exactly the same thing as you protect a child. Like love equals protection. <clears throat> and it's, I, I agree. I don't disagree in any way. It's just, it's definitely not the first thing that comes into my mind. You know, it's like if you love somebody, then you go do things with them. I'm a seven. You go spend time with them. You entertain them. You, you, yeah. And I think everybody would define what love looks like differently. If you love somebody a lot, what would you do? Why? Well, you would protect them. That's obvious. Why would you do anything else? Okay. Um, you seek to express strength and power in the things you do and avoid appearing weak in any way. Okay, we've already talked about that. So all those things she lists as you might be a type 8. And so if you <clears throat> hear that list and you go, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. You know, more than, you know, all of them or almost all of them. Absolutely, 100%. Why doesn't everybody agree to this? What, what other type is there? This is the only real way to be a person. Okay, you're probably a type 8. She says, if you're going to go on this journey of growth, you know, one of the first things to notice is to kind of see how you tend to project strength and power to avoid feeling vulnerable. And you go, what is vulnerable? Vulnerable is all the stuff that makes you feel like a child. Helpless, dependent, you need to be taken care of, you need to be helped, um, you don't know what to do, you got to wait on others to give you permission. All that stuff is vulnerability. And if all of that, you hear that and you think, yuck, 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 ooey, ooey, okay. <clears throat> You need to become more aware of your fear of showing weakness. Um, it helps you recognize the ways in which you need to be powerful and action-oriented in the things you do, but also learn to get in touch with the basic human emotions of fear, sadness, and insecurity. And again, a lot of times I think that's what's motivating what we see on the surface. And it helps me have more compassion with AIDS and to be a little less you know, reactive to a frustrated eight or an unhealthy eight is, 
you know, I'm seeing all this anger and blame on the surface, but if I really think about it, you know, what's really going on in there is maybe you're just afraid that, you know, your relationship is in jeopardy, or maybe you feeling insecure, or you're feeling like you don't have control of the environment. And that helps me have a little more compassion. And I think it would help you. It's not going to hurt you to investigate that about yourself and to sit with that for a moment. Um, and then here she says, the final stage of the journey, learning to acknowledge and fully experience that vulnerability and your natural sensitivity. This makes you softer, which probably sounds like a bad thing, but believe me, it's not, okay? Softer and more open and more approachable, more approachable. And again, that's if your goal is, I want to have, you know, loving, caring, kind, generous, gentle, equal relationships with people, then, okay, well then, softening up those rough edges a little bit and at least beginning to crack that surface and letting people in, well, what if they betray me? Oh, is that a fear? Is that is that a fear? That's vulnerability right there. What if I let them in and then they are not really my friends? They don't really have my best interest at heart. They, they betray that trust. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It will. But what's going to happen if you don't let them in? It's going to be very lonely in there. All right, guys. As always, thank you so much for watching. I hope uh, the video helps you. Helps you love the eight in your life or understand yourself a little bit more so that you can continue to grow on this journey. And as always, be present to life. I'll see you next time. Thanks.